Thank you very much. Uh, those are uh, three very tough acts to follow. I hope uh, it's a little difficult. To, uh, I feel like a little bit of a difficult position here. Um, but I want to. I want to just close off here by talking about uh, public opinion, uh, political leadership in a public opinion context. That's the field I work in. And you know, it's very strange as, as someone who works as a uh, as someone who works as a pollster. I, I have to say that. Uh, the whole NDP leadership uh, situation and kind of what has triggered it and what has transpired over the last few months, a lot of it has had to do with public opinion and what I do for a living. And, and that's really kind of a strange feeling. I should, I should clarify that um, our, our company, the company I work for, Probe Research, we, we don't do polling for parties, uh, but we do do polling for the free press that comes out every quarter and we uh, track uh, provincial voting intention every three months. So. And I, know, and, I, and I know just from the number of calls and emails I get from the media, from political junkies and from different people that, you know, those, those numbers that come out every so often are watched extremely carefully. I mean, the, the hits on our website go up a tremendous amount uh, every time those come out. Uh, and, and really, in a lot of ways, like it or not, public opinion research is really, it's, it's a litmus test for, uh, for political leadership. I mean, when we talk about a lot of the different things that go into leadership, uh, you know, there are obviously a lot of things that, uh, that Paul and, and David and Kelly referred to uh, throughout the, the course of the evening about how leadership is kind of done within the context of uh, uh, cabinet or within caucus. But, you know, in terms of how the, uh, you know, political parties, how governments deal with the public, a lot of it, and, and how leaders interact with the public, a lot of that is, is, is reflected back through uh, the prism of polling, of focus groups. So, so we, we, do, we do a poll that's measures vote intentions and we do some other questions. Um, private polling also plays a major role. One of the major incidents that I, as I understand it, that, that transpired, you know, that, that led to the Rebel 5 coming out uh, and, and saying what they said had to do with a major poll that was done privately by the NDP uh, that basically, in, in, in the words of one observer, they were going to be entering annihilation territory if, uh, uh, if things held up the way they were in terms of public opinion. Uh, so there's you know those particular aspects of it. Focus groups or focus groups where you're gathering with small groups of people to talk about uh, how they feel about different political leaders have to do a lot of and, and increasingly now uh, in, in today's uh, digital era, social media monitoring and what people are saying on Facebook and on Twitter is something that political parties are, are constantly uh, looking at when in terms in, in terms of how they're you know in terms of having a running read on, on how they're doing uh, as a party and how how much. The public likes that of their party. How much the party likes their, how much the public likes their leader. So just to kind of put it in context here in Manitoba, uh, this is uh, these are our polls that we do every quarter, and this is going back over basically going back to the last uh, provincial election, and then every quarter after that. And I've kind of been looking at the long trend line over the last little while, and I think there's really kind of four phases that uh, we can kind of talk about from a public opinion point of view in terms of what's happened with the NDP. So you see that orange slide, the you know, orange line that's kind of been on a bit of a slide. Uh, that's uh, party support for the NDP. Of course, they won 37 seats in the last election, uh, even though they only got three, three points more than the uh, progressive conservatives in terms of the popular vote. But thanks to uh, the, the wonders of the first past the post system, they were able to win a huge majority, uh, majority government. And then from there, uh, they kind of held fairly steady for about the next uh, year, year and a half or so. And then they started to, they, that lead started to erode. Now, Typically, between elections, what we see is the NDP vote will go down a little bit, the Conservative vote will go up, and then things tend to tighten up around the election. This has happened for the last few years. But when you sort of go to the, you know, from the, uh, the, the major I think, breaking point here is when you get to that post-PST increase period, where all of a sudden there's a huge slide in the NDP support, and the, uh, the NDP was down to 28% in the polls, which is the lowest that we've ever had in the 20 years of polling. And a lot of that vote, went over to the Liberals who had gone basically from the single digits into the low 20s. And when that happens, typically that means a, a conservative majority government in Manitoba. So that's kind of how it's, how it's gone. The PST increase really, I think, was the major marker that led to a, a big drop in public opinion, obviously. There was kind of a slow bit of recovery after the, uh, the NDP started to talk about what that PST increase was all about, how it was going to be about infrastructure and about uh, investing in frontline services, and then of course, after the leadership crisis hit, uh, we've now seen the Conservatives have gone up a fair bit, and, uh, and the NDP are uh, back down into the, uh, into the low 20s. And this just shows the same thing in Winnipeg, where uh, the four different phases, and, and elections, you know, quite frankly, are, are won and lost in the city of Winnipeg, and, uh, and over that period of time where the NDP had a huge lead, 
previously they had dropped. Uh, you know, when they had when the PSC increase happened, they dropped down the well back of the well back of the Tories. Uh, had actually started to do better, but then once the uh, leadership problems hit in the, in the fall, uh, have actually dropped down, uh, dropped down a bit. So a lot of this, you know, like I said, observers were watching this sort of thing very closely, and, and uh, these numbers very closely, and, and some of this would have factored into uh, the decision to uh, raise issues based on this leadership. Just just two things quickly, and this just kind of you know, I think shows you how important the PSD hype was in terms of a public opinion. Uh, measurements. So we, one of the questions that we asked for the free press a little while ago was about uh, whether or not Manitobans felt that the PST increase was necessary, because this was a major point of debate. And this just shows here that the majority felt that government could actually uh, fund some of those services and also fund infrastructure without uh, having to raise the PST increase. Uh, really, in a, a, you know, this is quite you know, a very small number of people uh, thinking that the PST increase was necessary. And of course, after the, uh, the, the the Rebel Five came out and did their thing and said that they were going to be uh, they were no longer in cabinet and didn't support Salinger's leadership, uh, we asked also as well about what how people felt about their actions and whether or not they were justified. And what was really interesting was when you look at it, the majority of the public felt that what you know that or 52 percent felt that what they did was the right thing to do. Only 26 percent said that it wasn't. But when you break it down, looking at uh, how people voted in Britain in the last election and how they would currently vote. Uh, you see the bar on the far the bars on the far right there, you actually see that among people who are currently sort of NDP supporters, they're the ones who are more likely to say that they shouldn't have done what they did. But if you sort of add them, also people who have left, you know, would have voted for the NDP in the last election, uh, but they're now say voting for the Liberals or the Conservatives, uh, it tends to be a little bit more even. So so quite clear I think what this shows is that uh, you know there are there are you know people out there who would have voted for other parties and Past, who I think you know definitely felt that uh, what they or who would have sorry who would have voted for the NDP in the past, but who are now currently putting their support with other parties because of that decline in the NDP support, are saying that really what they did was was justified uh, and that they uh, and that they should have done. But at the, at the same time, there's still this major uh, major split that occurs. You know, all of this I think really has to do and in, 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 you know and. It's been touched on already this evening about kind of how parties are sold to the public and how um, people, you know, for at one time it was more about partisan identification and always, you know, your family uh, would have supported that party, so therefore you were a supporter of this part of that party. Today, people are a lot more fluid in how people uh, end up making the choice in terms of which uh, party they're going to vote for. And large, you know, more and more depends on the leader. And I think, you know, in Canada, the first great example of that was the way that Pierre Trudeau. Uh, was sold uh, to the public. It wasn't just about the Liberal Party, it was about Pierre Trudeau and the, the image of Trudeau. Uh, and a lot of what his advisors did in the late 60s actually was borrowed from the United States in the way that John F. Kennedy was marketed to the, uh, the American public uh, in, a, uh, in a presidential context. You know, a lot of that went into uh, you know, presenting here someone who's vibrant, who's kind of a man of the times, uh, and he's going to be front and center. And, and the Liberal part of it was even though you know, the, the words there and, and just Trudeau's face, the liberal part of it kind of ended up becoming uh, less important. Nowadays, I mean, this is just the whole, it, it, nowadays every party does this. It doesn't matter, parties of the right, parties of the left. You know, we've seen it obviously in Manitoba with Gary Dewar and the NDP. Is Gary Dewar and his face were quite prominent and, and the NDP, today's NDP as they marketed themselves, were kind of secondary, but you see it in, you know, the, the federal NDP did a lot of the same thing. We saw it in Saskatchewan, Brad Wall and the Saskatchewan party. You, you name it, uh, it's, it's really about, you know, in a lot of ways, about marketing, uh, marketing the leader now, and, and the party is kind of a, a secondary thing. You know, another, another uh, research company had a very interesting poll. Part of this, you know, there's a there's sort of a classic uh, question that sort of people talk about in terms of, you know, party strategists talk about in terms of trying to think about how um, uh, parties, uh, you know, how, how to position leaders. And, and one of the classic questions is, which one of them would you rather have a beer with? And, uh, and some of my some of my colleagues in the market research industry did an absolutely fascinating poll recently, and it was about who would you rather they they, they presented respondents they interviewed about a thousand Canadians and they had who would you rather uh, uh, you know for each of these party party leaders and so they would Stephen Harper, Tom Mulcair, and Justin Trudeau and, and the results I think are very interesting and very telling so. For Stephen Harper, Canadians would much rather that he be CEO of a large company, someone that they would trust to give, get investment advice from, get career advice, give your children advice, and also negotiate a contract uh, for you were the things that we score the highest on. Uh, with, uh, with Pierre Trudeau, uh, actually most of the things are the things that he went on in terms of leadership. So he'd be the person people most likely want to go on a vacation with, 
Uh, so you trust him to pick a good movie. You try, trust him to you know sing your favorite song, survive in the wilderness. They didn't ask about zombie apocalypses. I think they should have been in the context of The Walking Dead. Um, and, and you know all these all these sorts of things are sort of related to likability. And really, it was quite clear Canadians were more likely to see him as being a person that they would like to spend more time with. And poor Tom will care. The only thing that he went on was that he would be the most likely to lend you a hundred dollars if you needed it, which I guess is kind of you know what people sort of have a, ascribed to the NDP as being more uh, you know more generous in giving uh, with money, but. Uh, but I thought this was absolutely fascinating because really, I mean, with, yeah, and, and you're, I, you're laughing, but I mean, it's a, I think it was actually sort of a serious thing here in terms of uh, how the part, you know, how the next federal election is going to shape up. If, if the next election is sort of just about who we like as a person, as our prime minister, I think Justin Trudeau has an excellent chance. If it's about who's going to be the most, you know, trusted to manage the economy and have a steady hand on the tiller and that sort of thing, those sorts of aspects favor Stephen Harper. And so I, so I think even, and, and, and then the parties in terms of how they're shaping the marketing strategies, I think are really, uh, you know, really trying to position it that way. So I thought this was a very, uh, very insightful, even though it seems kind of flippant on the, uh, you know, on the outside, I think it's a very insightful poll because it does tell us how the parties, I think, will try to position, uh, position the parties and how they've been doing it, quite frankly, over the last little while. The, the classic measure, though, of, uh, you know, and I think the thing that gets factored in more and more, especially as you sort of talk about it, and, and David's research, you know, really, really speaks to this, uh, is about, you know, the classic question of whether or not we approve or disapprove of a party leader's uh, performance. And, and what we see, this is from, Pro doesn't ask this that often, but when we do, uh, we, we sort of track this over, you know, we're asked this but once every two years. But uh, what we see here is really, I mean, uh, of the three party leaders in Manitoba, Greg Salinger's negatives, so the orange and the red, are quite quite a bit higher than his positives. Uh, and and for you know Brian Pallister, he's slightly seen as a little bit more positive, but still somewhat lukewarm. Uh, Rana Bakari, the Liberal leader, most people still don't know who they, who she is. And when we look at what's happened uh, since we asked this question a couple of years ago, really, I mean, it's no surprise. Greg Salinger's numbers really are, are down down significantly compared to what they were before. And again, this is another kind of data point or factor I think that people kind of take into consideration when they're thinking about uh, whether or not they're going to be able to uh, to lead with, uh, you know, to be able to run in the next election with a particular leader. And, and it's true of government, you know, it's true of the government, governing party, obviously, but it's also opposition leaders who kind of, uh, you know, deal with the same issue, although in this case, you know, their, their issue tends to be more one of whether or not they're recognized, and especially in the case of Rana Bakari. And, uh, you know, all of this, you know, kind of makes me realize, and, and I kind of got doing some research on this, and I realized that you can kind of see in some ways, you know, it's kind of like with the show Survivor, you know, the, the premiers in Canada, if you look at kind of the trend line in terms of their approval ratings, really, it's really kind of been, you know, which one is going to last till the end. So in, in 2011 and early 2012, there were, five, there were five elections that happened in fairly quick succession. So the first one was, was in Manitoba, uh, October 4th, 2011. Greg Salinger is elected with this huge majority. Two days later, Dalton McGuinty in Ontario was elected with a minority. They were, the Liberals had been a majority there, but they were down to a minority in that election. Uh, Newfoundland went to the polls about a week later, and Kathy Dunderdale, after taking over, a very similar situation to Manitoba, Kathy Dunderdale took over from very popular Danny Williams, uh, and the Progressive Conservatives won a big majority there. Brad Wall in Saskatchewan uh, won in November 2011, huge, huge win for them. And then Allison Redford is the new premier in Alberta in early uh, 2012. Now, this is uh, this is Angus, and, and, and David's had these numbers up, some of these numbers up a bit, but look what happens over the course of that time. So basically, if we look at Dalton McGinty first, he wasn't that popular going, you know, after the election, and he had a minority, he dropped, you know, his, his popularity started to plummet for a number of different scandals and reasons, and, uh, you know, once he kind of crossed, I sort of looking at this, I think 30% is kind of the danger zone, the most political leaders start to you know, contemplate, maybe it's time to take one for the team and move on and let someone else try. Uh, he really, you know, that's about the point where he slid down. Kathy Dunderdale, it's incredible how, fat, how far she dropped. 60% uh, popularity shortly after her election. Uh, she was, uh, they had all kinds of problems with uh, uh, different issues, uh, you know, health care and, uh, and, and uh, you know, hydroelectric uh, power in, in Newfoundland and a number of different issues that she's had to face. And by the time she was out, she was down to about 20%. Allison Redford, uh, yeah, you know, and, and you know, considering everything that happened with her, the expense scandals in Alberta, 
she was actually pretty popular at one time when she was first elected. Uh, people, when you know, you saw one of the last images, one of the last images there that I had back when it was one of her campaign posters, and it was the, the Alberta PC Party marketed her as being this isn't your father's PC Party, and a lot of people who were traditionally not conservative voters in Alberta voted for her. And she was actually quite popular. But of course, once the uh, you know the issues around first flying to South Africa, first class on a private jet, and you know all these other sorts of things that she got into trouble with, she really bumped down on the polls, and uh, and she got uh, she got voted off the island. You know the and then and then the one the one guy who probably should have been voted off the island but hasn't uh, is uh, Greg Salinger because he's been that, in that danger zone for quite some time, and he's just been dropping uh, dropping like a stone ever since then. So. He he continues to hang on, you know, hang on in this uh, in this particular uh, you know, thing. But he doesn't, uh, you know, certainly. You would think, compared to all the other ones who kind of been in the same boat, that he would have kind of, you know, saw the writing on the wall at the same time. And then there's the one that's absolutely inexplicable in how. He, well, actually, he, I shouldn't say that he's dropped. I mean, Brad Wall was 70 percent. Now I think he's in the low 60s. So you know, times are tough in Saskatchewan. So he's. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's, he's dropping a little bit, and uh, you know that's that's the only one who's really kind of survived and thrived in up those five premiers. But I guess the key things I want to I, I want to just leave you with is that I mean, public opinion really is a major consideration when it comes to the ongoing ability of a premier to govern. I mean, all these things kind of factor in in terms of you know dealing with dealing with cabinet and you know the exercise of hard power and soft power. But in terms of legitimacy, in terms of the public, and then how that ends up kind of getting fed back. Uh, to elected officials, I think public opinion is a major factor that a lot of people are paying attention to, and, and we really would be uh, it really would be unwise not to uh, not to consider you know to what extent that does have a, have an impact on a, uh, a premier's popular legitimacy. And really, Salinger I think is particularly unique, and it's a fascinating case study. I don't think there's any example of this or any precedent that I can find uh, that that exists for what has happened where. Sitting premier is trying to stay on and, and keep his job uh, in, in the face of uh, being at that uh, seventy percent popularity and having people in your own party calling for his head. And the other, you know, of course, the other key question really is kind of what you know the question that we start to debate. I think after March eighth is can the NDP reverse the current trend line with a new leader? You know, our, our polling did show that they were actually doing slowly, slowly starting to actually pick up some steam again, particularly in Winnipeg. Is it possible that they could, you know, with a, a new leader or even with Salinger somehow, um, could they could they reverse it? Could they win? Uh, is it, you know the next election is a year away, and uh, you know one one wonders. So I'll sort of leave it. I'll leave it at that. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Thanks.